Hello, this is Nikos Nimbriakopoulos from PCM Support. Welcome to another tutorial video. In this one, we will dive deeper into the PCM hyperstate connection, investigating how we can optimize the design of a second stage filter for DC DC power supplies. This may sound as an easy task, but actually it's a very interesting one, because there are a variety of issues that can arise if the second stage filter components are not selected with some caution. Imagine that we have this step down DC DC converter module with an integrated inductor. To make things more interesting, I will also grab an application note from Texas Instruments investigating this topic. In fact, there are multiple articles online showcasing that the process of choosing the second stage filter components may be trickier than you think. I really like this application because it showcases how modern electronics tools can take optimization algorithms into account to help you with this design choice. That being said, I will try to simplify things quite a bit when it comes to the control side, as our focus lies more on optimizing the filter component selection. So we will make the optimization based on switching frequency attenuation, system stability in form of phase margin and price. Let's imagine that our initial design had like a 6 dB of attenuation at the switching frequency. So if we do some math and based on the integrated inductor value to achieve the 6 dB of attenuation, we would need around 4.5 microfarad capaci capacitance at the output. But let's say we choose uh, a 6.81 uh, just to be on the safe side. So this is exactly what I've done here. Uh, parameterize the inputs. So the input voltage, target output voltage, the current for the load, the switching frequency and so on match the exact values of the application node. Let's first run the system in open loop. Okay, that was fast, one second. Obviously this is not nice, we want to change this. We want to follow a similar approach when it comes to control right here. So let me just grab my pre-built control loop, current and voltage loop, and let's now run again. I will bring back the open loop results and see the effects of the control. Okay, it looks so much better now, but what about the ripple? Let's zoom in. So we have some millivolts of output voltage ripple and let's imagine that this is not acceptable in our case, right? So maybe we're a bit optimistic for the animation with our first layer of filtering or maybe we couldn't do much better. We may consider adding a second stage filter to help us attenuate the ripple to acceptable limits. But there are some considerations we need to take into account. When you add a secondary stage of filter, essentially not only you add a second resonance to the system, but you also move your first resonance around. If you try to put some random components inside and see what happens, instability is well possible as the phase margin changes, right? So if your resonance moves at a place that it shouldn't be, then you can have problems. Of course, there are some good rules of thumb that you can follow. For example, when you add the second layer, first and foremost, you want to make sure that the second capacitance will be much larger than the first one. So this is also implied here. In order to have my second resonance fixed and not be annoyed by potential capacitive loading at the output, we want this to be a bulky capacitor. And on top of that, we want the second inductance to be quite smaller than the first one. I will make a constraint that this will be at least less than the half of the first inductance. And this is where hyperstatic comes into play. If you haven't watched the first tutorial video on how to get started with PCM hyperstatic, I totally recommend that you do that first and then come back here because I will skip some steps uh, on how to set this up. But essentially, hyperstatic is a platform that will allow you to apply optimization algorithms to your simulation without having to script everything yourself. It will handle, let's say, the meaningless labor, so you can focus on engineering and decision making. The goal here is to use this modern workflow to accelerate your individual performance and also the performance of your organization as a result. Okay, as usual, we have to parameterize everything and maybe try a random extra bulky LC combination here to see what happens. I can already see that we will push the first resonance on the lower end, which maybe cause some problems. So let me run this in the time domain. 
indeed I have a marginally stable situation here. The system doesn't look very nice at all, but I'm also interested to see what happens in the frequency domain. To do this, we need to get uh, the loop gain. I have actually pre-built my AC strip here. For those of you who are wondering, yes, PCM can calculate frequency responses of any converter topology with small signal analysis in no time. This is the perks of having a fast and robust solver. Here, we have the body plots showing the system frequency domain response. First, we will look at the crossover frequency and the minus 100 degree point on the phase plot. Right now, we are close to zero amplitude and nearly minus 180 degrees, meaning a very small phase margin, not ideal. And this is obvious in our time domain results. To improve this, we can set our target phase margin at 40 degrees. Hyperstudy can interpret these photo plots, adjusting inputs to optimize for a phase margin above this threshold. At the same time, we can have a secondary optimization goal, which could be uh, the maximization of the attenuation and even reduce costs for the components. So let's get into it. First, let's see how the body plots look like with just the first stage filter connected. This looks better with decent phase margin and gain, ma gain margins, so let's make sure we keep it this way. And let's not forget to mention that ESR is another consideration that can help us here. In this case, ESR is not a bad thing, stability-wise. We need it. We need it in order for the second resonance to be dumped and help us with stability. So let's make this a level 2 capacitor and parameterize the ESR. After a quick search online, we can come up with these sets of matrices that correlate capacitor quality and capacitance to ESR values. Our analysis will be more realistic if we include this information as well. Towards this goal, I digitized this data into a function called ESR electrolytic, which can correlate ESR with other design variables, so the ESR choice is not an independent variable inside HyperStudy. The less independent variables we have, the easier the optimization procedure becomes. Now that we understand the system better, let's move into HyperStudy and create a new project as usual. I will add a PCM project. Navigate your schematic file and click import variables. So HyperStudy seamlessly accesses the full list of PCM variables. Now let's deselect everything and just select the secondary capacitor, the ESR, secondary inductor, and click on the top left icon to import these variables. Then click Next. OK, now we should also add the voltage rating options for the capacitances as well as the quality options. On top of that, let me add another one, which will be the secondary capacitance in microfarads, so C2 in microfarads. When you go and add your own custom variables, HyperStudy will automatically create a secondary project which is called internal math. Don't worry about it, it will just stay there, you don't have to do anything else. So the number of hyper variables actually increased, but remember that the C2 in microfarad, C2 and ESR inputs will be linked into one. So the number of iteration may be less than you think. So let's proceed by defining the discrete variables. For the quality, we can either have zero for normal quality or one for high quality. Next, we need to add the links as well as the constraints, because remember that we have to follow some guidelines when it comes to the capacitance and inductance values for the second stage filter. So this C2 value is what actually reaches PCM, and this needs to be in farads. So we can open the expression here, and we, should, and we can start typing. The microfarad option is automatically generated, so I need to multiply that with E minus 6, click OK to save this, now, as you can see, this variable is linked to this one. So we also need to link the ESR. This is where our ESR electrolytic function will come handy. So for this function, the first input is the capacitance in microfarads. Next, we have the V-rated value, and then we have the quality. 5.4 is the preview value here, and this is calculated based on the nominal values for quality, which is 1, and V-rated, which is 10. What's left is the constraints. 
The constraints can be really useful if you just wanted to input whatever here, but in the end you want to make sure that those input values will actually make sense. Some basic criteria you need to keep is uh, for the rating, for example. You want the V-rated input voltage to be larger or equal, let's say, than, let's say two times your output voltage, which is five, so 10. Okay, this holds true for all options because V-rated values where input that where input here makes sense. Another constraint can be the secondary inductance value. So we need this to be 20 times smaller than 10 micro, which is, was the initial value. Let's put the final constraint for the capacitance. We want this to be larger than the first one. Let's say five times larger than the first one, which was 6.8 micro. Okay, this is mostly feasible because we have some lower values here that do not comply with this constraint and hyperstudy will make sure that those values are not co being considered. After the test model step is complete, we need to add the data sources. Essentially, bring the PCM results in hyperstudy. You can find the step-by-step -step procedure on how to do this in our first Getting Started with PCM hyperstudy tutorial. I will now bring in the bottom plot results for both amplitude and phase, and rename the data sources variable names to match the information they contain. Now, the fun part begins. That is the definition of the key performance indicators, which are single value outputs we call output responses in hyperstudy. First of all, let's find out the zero crossing of the amplitude border plot. To do this, I have implemented a function, this zero crossing function, which calculates the frequency of the zero cross of the amplitude border plot. Now, let's define the crossover frequency. And then we can click evaluate to get the result. Now let's find the phase of the crossover frequency. For this purpose, I have created the second function. So this will give me the phase at the specific frequency. I can then use this to calculate the phase margin. Click evaluate. There we have it. Now let's define the phase margin. On top of that, let's calculate the attenuation of the second stage of the output filter. We have an extra 27.3 dB of attenuation in this initial run with the nominal values. Defining our optimization goals and constraints is super straightforward. First, in the goal section, set a constraint to keep the phase margin above 40 degrees. We also want to maximize the attenuation based on our input variable combinations while ensuring that the phase margin constraint is always respected. This is the power of hyperstudy. Okay, click evaluate again and then click on next and add. In this case, we're going to select the optimization workflow. We will inherit from the setup. So the setup is like a template and then all the steps are copy pasted here. We just need to run the definition once. Once we get the results and those nice green icons, click next. Our output selections are copy pasted from the initial setup. And then in the specification section is where we select our optimization algorithm. So there is a list of pre-built algorithms here. Some of them are for single goal optimizations while others perform with multi-goal optimizations. So for this purpose, I'll select the second one, which is the global response search method. You don't have to have a master's degree in operation research or be equipped with optimization programming skills to use these pre-built algorithms. Essentially, any engineer can just use this graphical interface to leverage the potential of these optimization tools without being an expert in this specific field. For this example, we will select 150 evaluations. You can put a number here that makes sense, of course, based on the number of independent input combinations you want to investigate. In the more section, there are also more advanced settings that you can tweak, but I will just leave them in default for now. Next, let's click apply here. In the next step, we should make sure that all the tasks are enabled and we can put a lot of simulations to run in parallel and then click evaluate tasks. So six jobs start automatically together and let's wait for the results to finish. Okay, so here are the results, 100 and 50 of them actually. So as you can see, we have a lot of violations. 
all the set of inputs that resulted in a phase margin lower than 40 degrees violate the phase margin goal, which means they are not taken into account in the end. What happens here is that HyperStudy tries out some values and then it's essentially seeking for the best combination of inputs to hit your goals. So we want the attenuation to be as high as possible, for example. I can also bring in the phase margin. So this is a nice example because we hit a higher phase margin here, but then we went back to a lower one, maybe because the attenuation for this option was a lot bigger. And then we also found that there are some other combinations that can lead to both a greater phase margin and a greater, and a greater attenuation as well. So this is typically happening in the end stages of your evaluation data and HyperStudy highlights the best set of inputs with this green color for you so you can identify it right away. Of course, in the post-processing section, you have several tabs here to explore insights into your simulations. Uh, there is the, the data sources tab where you can see all the results for every combination of inputs, both amplitude and phase, um, and of course, other post-processing options as we discussed in the first tutorial. But in my opinion, the most interesting fact is that at the end, HyperStudy identifies essentially what is the best set of inputs, the best combination of them. Of course, always taking into account the bounds you put and the constraints in order to hit your goals. Now, I'm curious, and maybe you are curious as well, to see how this set of inputs perform in the actual time domain simulation. Let's go back to PSIM and copy paste the optimized values in here. But first, let's run the time domain simulation without the second stage LC filter. Save the waveforms and run again after activating the second stage. We have done a very good job of mitigating the ripple to a nice extent. So if I recall correctly, we added an additional 74 dB of attenuation while keeping a good stability with the phase margin criteria. I believe we made our point here. HyperStudy just finds the best set of inputs to hit your goals. Now, as you can see on the left pane, we have a secondary optimization workflow on top of the first one. Actually, I can have as many as I want and inherit options from the previous ones. So in my second one, I have included real market data for the electrolyte capacitor selection. These data are included in an input lookup table. This lookup table is essentially an Excel file which was downloaded from Mauser or work with your own one if your organization has special prices from the vendors and maybe work with uh, data from your SAP system and so on. But the concept is the same. We can include this data and let factors like price and size affect our design decisions. So you just have to include the path to that CSV and uh, parse all data based on the part number. Then when I click next, I have an extra input variable, which is a categorical one and, uh, and includes all the part numbers in my electrolytic capacitor list. So nothing changes here. You just have to click run definition again, and then based on the part number, all the outputs like uh, price and size are included in our output responses. So the next obvious step would be to add another optimization goal, which is to minimize the price for the actual options I have from the market right now. We now have more than one green lines because we have uh, more than one goals in this case. First and foremost, we want to have a controllable system and then we want to maximize the attenuation, but at the same time, we don't want to break the bank. So if we see the first two green lines, for example, 47 uh, microfarad was quite cheaper, almost uh, half the price of the bigger one. So essentially, Hyper Study comes up with the best options and still lets you decide based on your needs. The trick here is to be smart about how you define your optimization goals. And don't forget that these are mathematical tools. So this will try to find the maximized or minimized and constrained values, no matter what. It's your responsibility to make sure that those values do make sense after all. So we can now leverage these tools to optimize what you can basically, because it's a fairly easy to set up. It takes minutes, minutes to run and at the end, take results that make sense based on market info. So I hope this was helpful. Please let me know your feedback in the comments and see you in the next one. Bye.